Okay. Where we were up to is that uh, we had looked at the different developments of the, of the uh, covenants in the prophets, and uh, you had seen a, uh, a real development, but you hadn't seen any change. You'd seen a mixing up of the covenants as they dovetail together to create the future kingdom. But uh, we haven't still answered the question, not fully anyway, about Christ's role. Now, yesterday, for those of you that weren't here, we did turn to Isaiah 49, and so I think we ought to go there again. Isaiah 49, and remind ourselves of something that was, uh, was pointed out. Was it? I think it was yesterday, was it this morning? So Isaiah chapter 49, and uh, we'll start from verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. This is the servant that's been spoken of here. And then it says this, Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth. You see that? That's talking, that's a servant song, uh, same as Isaiah 53 is a servant song. It's one of those that are in Isaiah. And that passage is talking about Christ. I will give you as a covenant. And we identify that covenant as the new covenant. And in this very context, what does Christ bring about? He brings about salvation. Do you recall that none of the other covenants had the means of their own fulfillment within them? They relied on something external, or should I say now, someone external in order for them to be fulfilled. And be fulfilled, by the way, in the way that God said it. That those oaths would come true because God is faithful. Okay, with that in mind, let's go on and look at Christ and the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 is the classic passage for this. It's not the only uh, passage that deals with the new covenant. It mentions it as a new covenant. There are very many others. You find them in Deuteronomy 30. You find them actually all over the place. Any of those spirit passages, okay? For example, Isaiah 11, um, particularly Ezekiel 36, we maybe will turn to that so you can see an example of a New Covenant passage that doesn't talk about the New Covenant, but certainly implies it. But this one, let's have a look. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, because it was... Remember, a bilateral covenant. They took the oath too. Though I was, notice that, a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people no more. Shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will 
forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. According to this passage, God will one day wipe away the sins of his rebellious people, Israel. And he's going to do it by taking them from under the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant, which they couldn't keep, which they broke, and putting them under a new covenant, which is a covenant of salvation. Do you see that? All right, so what's Christ's relationship to this new covenant? Let's have a look. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, the spirit to those who walk on it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. And that's earlier, that's in Isaiah 42. There you have the creation being spoken of. You have the fact that the elect one, this is Christ, who's going to come, the servant, He's also going to bring forth justice, not just for Israel, but for the Gentiles, for the nations. He's going to establish justice in the earth, the entire earth. And it's going to be done through Christ, this is Messiah being spoken of, being given as a covenant. As a covenant. We've already seen this one in Isaiah 49, so let's move forward here. Here's the New Testament. Luke, you're familiar with this. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay, let's pay attention here. It's Jesus. This is the institution of the Lord's Supper. He's taking the cup and (coughs) symbolically he is saying this cup is a token, you might say, is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now, who's he talking to? Well, no, I mean, in the context, who's he talking to? The disciples, that's right, he is. Now, let's remember that the uh, disciples who became the apostles, they are the foundation of the church. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstones, talking about the church there in Ephesians 2.20, this means that the Lord's Supper that was taken in Luke 22 is the same that we partake of now. Okay? It's given to us. Well, it's a new covenant ceremony. There are people, you know, who have all kinds of problems putting the new covenant here or there. Or, or the new covenant's just made with Israel, isn't it? Because in Jeremiah 31, it just says Israel. It doesn't say the church. Well, of course, why would it say the church in Jeremiah? It doesn't say the church anywhere in the New Old Testament. So that's not a very good argument. But when Jesus institutes the new covenant, he institutes it with the guys that will be the apostles, the foundation of the church. 
And just to seal it, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says these well-known words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It's not just looking back, it's looking forward, and there's a reason for that. You see, in the Lord's Supper, what we know as the first and second comings of Christ are fused together. Have you ever noticed that in the Old Testament? where the first and second comings are fused together. You see it a lot in the messianic prophecies. You know, behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son and, you know, call his name Emmanuel and so on, and it goes on. And uh, chapter 9 also of uh, the book of Isaiah speaks about uh, the... uh, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given... And his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And it says he's going to sit on the throne of David. And he continues. Well, he hasn't done it a very, he hasn't done very much of that. I mean, he has been born. He's been given. But he hasn't established a government on earth. And that, by the way, is definitely what was involved in that context. He hasn't sat on David's throne. And he hasn't brought peace as the Prince of Peace. You see, you've got the first and the second comings fused together as one work. You see it in uh, Micah, chapter 5. Okay? It, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the religious leaders were asked by Herod, you know, in what town will Messiah be born? And they could tell him where. Because Micah says, and you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you be little among the clans of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me he that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Who is it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. You have the first and the second comings, the birth in Bethlehem, but the rule you haven't got yet, yet they're put together in the prophecy. The first and the second comings are put together. What we have, you see, is that we have the first and second comings, one work, and the, but they are divided. And the reason they're divided is simple. People rejected Jesus when he came. We're going to look into that. But before he went, he instituted the Lord's Supper, and that, again, fuses the first and second coming of Christ. I hope that uh, maybe you don't know this, but the Old Testament has more to say about what we know as the second coming of Christ than it does about the cross. Now, the cross, without it, we've had it. Without it, we could have no new covenant. We could have no hope. Yet, with it, the world's still a bit of a stinky place, quite honestly, isn't it? It's still a bit of a problem place, yes? We want it to change, but we know that the only one that can change it is the Lord, and he'll only change it when he returns. That's where the emphasis is. That's when he'll get the glory. That's when he'll wash away, wipe away all of the governments of this world, all the politics of this world. And he will set up a righteous kingdom and he will institute peace and justice in the world. That will bring him glory. Then the world that was created through him and for him will be ruled over by him. And why not? He died in it. He died in it. Why wouldn't you think he would want to rule it? Anyway, getting ahead of myself. (laughs) 
here's a passage in the book of Hebrews that is often misunderstood. Now, earlier I said that the Greek word that's used in the LXX, the uh, old Greek Bible of the, the uh, Old Testament, and uh, the New Testament Greek is diatheke. That's the word that's used. That's the word that's used to uh, translate covenant in the book of Hebrews. Everywhere that you see it, apart from in two verses. Then things change, and then they go back to covenant again, which is really strange. You know this verse. I'll read it for you. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Notice that. By means of death, for the redemption of transgressions under the first covenant, there's the Mosaic covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, uh, which I think is a reference to the Abrahamic covenant. For where there is a testament, this is the New King James, but it's a lot of versions, where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives, which I should have put in there, and I didn't. <laughs> Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. And it goes on to speak about the blood of the new covenant. It then changes and replaces uh, testament with covenant. That is a misunderstanding, and it's a mistranslation of that passage. Uh, here is uh, one of the latest and best commentaries on the Epistle to the Hebrews, although this has been known for quite a long time. P.T. O'Brien um, has a long section on it. This is just two parts that I've uh, brought out of his comments on this. But he says this, As we have seen, the context of verse 15 seems to demand the sense of covenant in the following verses. Because only covenants have mediators. Testaments don't have mediators. <coughs> but he says he's the mediator of the new covenant. So you would expect that he would go on to talk about a covenant that is mediated, not a testament. And it says, while in verse 18, mention is made of the first diatheke, namely the Sinai event, and hence can only be a covenant. So what are the translators doing? Slipping into the word testament and testator in uh, these verses. Well, it's because they are reading modern ideas of a last will and testament into a 2,000-year-old book. And they're thinking, well, of course, you know, uh, the you make a will, and when you kick the bucket, then that's when they get all your stuff. So that's what they've put in here. You know, the testator has to die. But uh, O'Brien goes on to say, what our author says in verses 16 and 17 does not correspond to any known form of Hellenistic or indeed any other legal practice. Going back 2,000 years plus, you can't find anything like what we call the last will and testament. There are last wills and testaments, but, as he goes on, a Hellenistic will was secure and valid when it was written, witnessed and deposited, not when the testator died. Further, the distribution of the estate could occur when the testator was living, and we know that if we've read the parable of the, tell me, prodigal son, because he gets his inheritance before his dad has kick the bucket, doesn't he? You see, if we'd just pay attention to the Bible, if we would just let the Bible interpret itself, we wouldn't get messed up this way. This is not, I'm not criticizing these people, but if you've ever thought covenant, 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 and then all of a sudden testament, testament, testator, and then back to covenant again, what's going on? It's because of this misunderstanding. The word should be translated covenant uniformly all the way through. Now, when you have that understanding, then you can translate it something like this. 
For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the... Well, what has to die? Look at the last passage there. Look at the bottom. What has to die? An animal. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. There has to be. Without blood, there's no remission of sin. Isn't Jesus the Lamb of God? You see, Jesus offered himself. That's what the author's trying to get across. He offered himself. He put himself on the altar. He is the, the new covenant. I mean, good grief. He's the mediator of the new covenant. It's his own blood that seals it. How much more identification do you want than the fact that he's the new covenant? The new covenant is different from the other covenants in that it's personal, and it's personal because it's Jesus Christ. The lamb slain since before the foundation of the world. So let's look at this. The servant then in Isaiah 42 and 49 is made a covenant. Say so that's weird language. Well, follow it. He inaugurated the new covenant in Luke 22. His blood is the blood of the new covenant in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul calls him and his co-workers in 2 Corinthians 3 ministers of the new covenant. And he's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for you. <laughs> he's the mediator of the new covenant. He is the covenant animal or offering by offering himself. In Hebrews 10.9, Jesus also takes away the first covenant that he may bring in the new because he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when the sin of the world, those that believe, is taken away, the Mosaic covenant cannot condemn. So look at this. What the new covenant does is that it takes away the Mosaic Covenant and replaces it with the New Covenant. Now, once the New Covenant, which brings salvation, which brings renovation, restoration, which clears the guilty, once that is in place, I hope that you can see nothing blocks these other covenants from being... Um, coming through literally I mean literally they don't have to be spiritualized you don't have to make them types or you know shadows of anything they're not shadows of anything they are what they are you say if that's true why hasn't Israel for example why aren't they now enjoying their covenant blessings well the answer is given in Paul, Paul, in Romans 10, in the book of Hebrews, but you know anyway, because of unbelief, they will not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, until they do that, until they look on the one who was pierced for them, they will not enter into the new covenant, which is why Jeremiah puts the new covenant for Israel in the last days. But the new covenant is made with the church now. Are there two new covenants? No, because there are not two Jesuses. It's one Jesus, one Lord. There's one new covenant, and everybody has to pass through it in order to get to the kingdom. Everything goes through Christ, okay? Everything goes through Christ. Notice also the Mosaic covenant is on the bottom now. Because Jesus fulfilled it, didn't he? And he fulfilled it for us. So for that reason, we now have new covenant hope. And these covenants, which are the major planks of the creation project, the reason why God started the whole thing off in the first place, 
you can now see that nothing is stopping the inauguration and eventual fulfillment and culmination of these things but unbelief. Amen. All right, any questions? Yes. That's a good question. Uh, is God going to implant, as it were, this new birth, this belief in them at, in one, at one time? Or do they have to be brought to repentance? It's a bit of both. He's going to bring them to repentance when they look on the one they pierced. Okay? When he comes back, they will know that's the one they pierced. Okay? They will mourn. At that time, I believe that's when that Ezekiel prophecy, they will mourn at the, you know, the, for the design of the temple. It's been given. They will realize all this time without the temple. Okay? They will mourn. When they mourn, you see, that is when they're ready to receive it. So the Lord brings it about that uh, he creates the circumstances. And by the way, the circumstances include <laughs> the Antichrist and the tribulation. But at the end of that, when he returns, then, yes, they're ready to receive him as their Lord. Yes. Any other questions on this? Come on. <laughs> All right, go to Ezekiel 36 quickly. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36. Thirty-six. And oh, you want the verses? Good idea. Here's a long chapter. Let's have a look at chapter 36. And verse, uh, let's see, 20, we'll start then, start there. Watch this closely. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's a metaphor. This is not infant baptism. But this is the proof text for infant baptism. But it's got nothing to do with it. And you shall be clean what is he talking about? I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, notice that please, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers you shall be my people, and I will be your God. They're going to be given the Holy Spirit. There are many passages in the Old Testament that speak about this time when the Holy Spirit is going to be given to Israel. Joel 2 is a, a well-known one. And so there's an expectation of this that's created in the Old Testament that Israel 
will finally receive the Holy Spirit. 